Could you start the recording, please? That's us. Thanks, Robert. Uh, ask David just to set out uh, how we're going to uh, play this. Thanks, Bob. It's just, just a small point, but just a clarification. During the reset, just to make sure everybody present and participating is clear that before we go to the vote, and Joe will come in with the financial information in a minute, just to be absolutely clear, uh, members have a report in front of my suite of recommendations. As members know, Councillor McMahon had moved an amendment in respect to the proposal and the proposed treatment around the bulky uplift charge, and Joe will bring in the cost implications of that in a moment. Uh, that one, I think, was also accepted by Councillor McGann Council was so that's not actually part of the vote, but it is part of the changes that are being proposed for you to consider and and give your support to. The point of clarification, just to be absolutely clear, is the recommendation around the brown bin charge was almost in two parts, if you like. It was to increase it from the current £30 to £40 and thereafter to link it to that median charge so that in future years the East Ayrshire Council brown bin charge would be set in accordance with the median. So it's just for completeness that the effect of the amendment would be effectively to retain the £30 charge, not apply the £40 charge and not participate in the median arrangement going forward. I'm just looking for that clarification, thanks. Last, last Joe to... No, Councillor Mackay. Thank you. David, yes, I think I think we understood that and I think we're aware that, you know, to alter that at any point is something that is open to every single member to come back to do as part of our budget process in February again. So it's not a once and for all time. We have the opportunity to revisit that again uh, on, a, on at least an annual basis. Yeah, yeah, and I was neither buying or selling, as I want to say, but I was just trying to clarify is in terms of those financial implications all officers can cost and, and what Joe will share will be the financial implication of not applying the £40 charge because obviously in terms of future years, any further increase when the median, the median is applied, it won't be known so it can't be quantified. So it was just to, for completeness, highlight that the picture that will be now given, the information will be given is the best information that can be given in the circumstances and I appreciate that. Thanks for the clarification. Thanks, Provost. Right, thank you. Uh, over to Joe. Thank you, Provost. Um, so, uh, the the proposals are based on a, a fairly complex spreadsheet, very detailed interdependencies within it. But the the first option around Council McMahon and the bulk uplift moving from five items to seven items uh, would have a, a net cost of twenty thousand pounds a year. Um, reducing the charge, however from £39.80 to £34.80 would incur a net loss of income of an additional £23,000 a year, taking that total for that option to £43,000 a year, or in terms of the model that Blair and I are, are more than well acquainted with over the last so many months, um, that's a payback, that's a loss of income to the waste budget over a 10-year period of £430,000. The second option from Councillor Mackay, which is um, the to remove the proposal to uplift from £30 to £40 for the, the garden waste permits, that results in a, a net loss of income to the service of £200,000 a year. So when added together, uh, that is £243,000 of a negative impact on an already stressed budget. In terms of the model and the important payback period, and then payback period is critically important because that's when the service will pay back the capital fund, then that results in a 2.430 around two and a half million pounds of an impact on the budget, on the waste budget over that 10 year period. I have to stress again, members, that it's important that the repayment is made to the capital fund that will have first option on, on, most, on any funding made, which means that that 2.430 would need to be found from a range of other options yet to be determined across the council or indeed in waste. So we'll add, we would ask, add a substantial sum 
on to those sums that, that you know about and we'll talk more about on Wednesday. Provost, happy to stop there. Thanks very much, Joe. Councillor McMahon. Yeah, just for clarification, Joe, in the 10 year model, you, 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 uh, for the first option I put, you said that would be uh, 43, would be 430, which, which was clarified. So the 10 year model for the brown bin, where you, you said one year was 200,000, and clarification on that would be 2 million. Okay, thank you. Right, for, oh, Councillor McGee. I, I thanks, Provost. I mean, uh, at the start of the, uh, this presentation, Ken Potwar, uh, thanking Blair and his team, uh, as I would do myself, for uh, the hard work they've put into this and the time they've taken to get around all members. Uh, and we're saying, Ken, it was a really extensive, comprehensive look at the whole thing. And now we're hitting out the park for two and a half million pound. It seems kind for a council that's uh, and for a, a pair of our council that's uh, been dealt to go away and fin this money. Again, we seem to be kicking the feet for under it. Um, I, <clears throat> I'm only one councillor, but I was quite happy uh, with the presentation as it was. And although I'm only one person, I would be but an additional motion to say that we go with the paper as is. I haven't got a seconder for that, but I'm putting that forward. Thank you. We'll get to the protocols uh, in a minute. I think there's still some more uh, discussions. OK, folks, Councillor McMahon. Rob, it's taken into consideration what Councillor McGee's proposal is, and I get that, John, we sent him away to do that review. I understand your views and the money and time that's been spent on doing it and no accepting it. I am prepared to withdraw the £5 offer reduction, but to keep it at seven items. I would... Uh, John Mc, uh, Councillor McGee would. Hold on, hold on. That's John come up with a discussion point at this point. Um, are you agreeing with what John's saying, but you're withdrawing the part, the five pound? I'm withdrawing the five pound, but I want it extended to seven items. Seven enough. items, yeah, yeah, okay. Right, we'll work out the pro, uh, the, <laughs> the logistics of that, leader. I was just for the sake of uh, quite uh, if John's accepting that, happy to second this proposal. I am. Councillor Mackay. Much, and I don't want to detract at all from the work that has been done or from my comments over the work. It is really important that that's all set out. It is one about political choices, and I think I have made very clear what our political position is on that, and we accept there are consequences for that. It is over a 10-year period. Thank you. So we need a, a second offer. For you, Provost, I think what we need, and I'm sorry if I've missed it, we need confirmation for Councillor McGee, who had indicated an intent to move the recommendations full stop as to whether, as offered by Councillor Reid, Councillor McGee is willing to make that motion, the recommendations, but with the tweak to the bulky uplift being seven items rather than five. That would be the one change that I think would then beget the uh, leader's support to second that motion, then we'll get to a vote. But if Councillor McGee isn't willing to amend his motion, subject to getting a seconder, and wishes to move the recommendations entirely without the adjustment to the seven items, then we'll need further clarification what the position is of other members. So it's probably over to Councillor McGee just now, probably through you. Thanks, Provis, and, 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 and thanks to other members. Yeah, uh, my motion was to accept as is all the costings, but I'm more than happy to accept that going for five 
the seven items might not be too much a, a burden. A, maybe need some clarification for Blair regarding that. But I would like to keep all the questions as was in the report. Thank you. I don't know if it would benefit from further private discussion, Chair, but while we're here then, uh, what was quantified, Councillor McGee, was that the move from five to seven items on a bulky uplift, with no change to the charge that's proposed, £39 something, that change would be £20,000 a year. So the cost of the cost of the council of allowing seven rather than five is twenty thousand pound a year, which might be viewed de minimis. If you're comfortable with that, then as we said, if uh, the, the 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 position would be that if you're happy to amend your original motion to include the change to seven items, then that would uh, let, gain the support of the leader and second you and then it would be straight to a vote on the recommendations but with seven items versus the recommendations with seven items and retaining the brown bin charge at £30 and not applying the median charge in the future as proposed by Councillor Mackay. So that bit will be going to the vote. It's just trying to clarify the motion before we get to the amendment. Sorry, that was my error. I, the 20000 was clearly explained by Joe earlier. And uh, accept that, and that's um, happy to accept that. Thank you. Right, thank you, uh, leader. So, in that case, I'd be happy to second uh, Councillor McGee's motion. Right, thank you. We've got a proposal seconder. I'm going to uh, Councillor Mackay. Absolute clarity. So we will stick with if there is the five to seven and that's being accepted, we would stick with that. If there is no increase in or no reduction in the cost, we will also stick with that. The change then is in relation to, uh, I think it's recommendation 11, and that is in relation to the brown bins. Thank you. Thanks for that. Councillor Adams. Thanks, Provis. It's worth noting that Jim, uh, sorry, that the figures that Joe provides are based on all the knowledge he has. We can't see into the future and we don't know how many people will be put off having a brown bin because of the rise. So Joe's making predictions, uh, which is valid, absolutely fine, but we need to take that into account as well. Those figures are not perhaps a fair reflection, but they're as fair as we can provide. Folks, hold on, hold on. Councillor Linton, we're waiting patiently. Thanks, thanks, Provost. Um, it was just really, Joe, I mean, year one, 200,000. Is there not a, com a, a compounding effect going on here as well, though? So just to, you know, just go 10 years at 200,000 to give you the 2 million, I would have thought the, the, the potential for that figure to be substantially higher than that. So, so in the model, we've kept things uh, like this as simple as we possibly could, recognising the complexity of the of the spreadsheet itself. But you're right, because that uplift for future years will be at a certain level yet to be determined. So, yes, you're right. Thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Richardson, is anybody else? Well, very, very, thanks, Provost. Very, very quickly, because I know we want to get to the vote and speed things up a wee bit. But you know, Joe does a brilliant job with figures. Uh, Ian's uh, good in figures as well. But and there's a bit of what ifs and all of this. But obviously, if we move the bulky uplifts to seven items, surely that's got to have the effect out there on the general public of more people thinking, "Well, I can get rid of seven items. I'll use the bulky uplift service. Therefore, we hopefully save money on flight tipping." But that, again, is a big, big what if. But it should have that effect, I would hope. Well, that all comes down to our uh, housing officers to explain the situation if you've got a, a lot of bulky uplifts, work with your neighbour and half the cost, see how you can go. But uh, we'll ask our officers to do that. Leader. I mean, Councillor, just to reflect on Councillor Adam's point, uh, really, you know, at the end of the day, we tasked officers to, to come out with their best estimates they can, and that's what they've done. Uh, and sure, factors can change, but it's still an estimate, and it can go up or it can go down. But the one thing that will remain the same, that there will be a, a quantity of people in the East Ayrshire who are in flats, etc., that don't have gardens, will subsidize, be subsidising people that do, and that figure will not change. Right, I think we're OK. David's explained that I think it's coming down to uh, a, a clear vote. Is Peter. Thank you, Provost. Um, 
during a cost of living crisis, we're talking about putting the price of lifting the bins up by 33%, if I've got my arithmetic right. Um, for that reason, I'll be opposed to it, and I'd like to second what Councillor Maureen Mackay is proposing as an amendment. Thank you. That's what I was going to ask for, a seconder. Right, we're OK. We'll go to the vote. Over to Julie. Thanks, Provost, and thanks, members. So I'll call the roll, uh, the roll, please. So if you can indicate your support for either the motion or the amendment. And to remind members, the motion is by Councillor McGee, seconded by Councillor Reid, and the amendment is Councillor uh, Mackay, seconded by Councillor Peter Maben. So Provost Jim Todd. Motion. Councillor Stephen Canning. Motion, please. Councillor Ellen Friel. Motion, Jim. Councillor John McGee. Motion. Councillor Elaine Kevin. Motion. Councillor Maudie Mackay. Amendment. Councillor David Richardson. Motion. Councillor James Adams. Councillor Lillian Jones. I'll vote for the amendment, Julia. I'm opposing the 33% uplift and the increase of brown bin charge. Thank you. Right, OK, thanks. Councillor Ian Everybody Linton. had a chance. It's the vote now. Councillor Ian Linton. Motion. Councillor Douglas Reid. Motion. Councillor Graham Barton. Motion. Councillor Graham Boyd. Motion. Councillor Neil Ingram. Motion, thanks. Councillor Peter Maben. Amendment, please. Councillor Claire Maitland. Motion. Councillor Beverly Clark. Motion. Councillor Sally Cogley. Motion. Councillor Kevin McGregor. Amendment, thanks. Councillor Linda Maben. Amendment, thanks. Deputy Provost Claire Leach. Motion, thanks. Councillor William Lennox. Motion. Councillor Alice Simmons. Amendment. Councillor Billy Crawford. Amendment. Councillor Jim Kyle. Amendment. Councillor Jim McMahon. Motion, thanks. Councillor Neil Watts. Amendment. Councillor Drew Filson. Motion. Councillor Jennifer Hogg. Motion, please. Councillor Elaine Stewart. Amendment, please. Thank you, members. So the motion is carried by 19 votes to 11. OK, folks, thanks very much. Thank you. And please, uh, a bit of etiquette, please, from all members. Everybody gets a chance to speak, everybody. And you're given a lot of time to put your points across. Please don't um, have uh, the bad manners to interrupt uh, proceedings, please. Uh, we're going on to item seven, which is the annual report of the Chief Social Work Officer. Uh, there's two papers for Marion today. This is the first one. Over to Marion. Thank you, Provost. Um, my note said good morning, members, but that's clearly <laughs> wrong. Um, good afternoon, members. It gives me great pleasure to introduce and to present to you the annual Chief Social Officer Report for the year just past 2023-2024. In presentation of the annual Chief Social Officer Report, a short video has been produced, which will highlight some of the key areas of development over the last year. For the video, please, I wanted to say a few words. Or I should say, I have my fingers crossed at the video, please. I've been well warned by Eddie. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I have, as I've said before, the role of being your Chief Social Work Officer is a real, real genuine privilege. It's a position that allows me to become involved in the social care and social work that is delivered across East Ayrshire. It takes me beyond my own portfolio as the Head of Children's Healthcare and Justice. Um, and it allows me to see and hear about all the key developments that are taking place. And I, hum I am humbled every day by the work that happens in East Ayrshire to support pe the people in East Ayrshire live their best possible lives. As Chief Social Officer, I have professional responsibility for the social work and social care practice delivered in East Ayrshire and take this responsibility seriously. The report sets out the wider context and governance around the, around the role. I hope you see the report that I've sought to take a strength-focused approach to highlight the range, scale, and depth of the work that our social work and social care workforce deliver. 
whilst not glossing over the areas that we need to develop, improve and simply get better at. Peppered throughout the report and the video are some personal stories and images. Um, we do have permission to share those, so pl please be assured. Um, these personal stories, I hope, serve to illustrate the positive outcomes that our social workers and social care workers achieve in a day in day out basis. Across all services over the course of the year, a number of contacts and interactions that take place is the number that takes place is vast, with the vast majority being positive. However, that's not to say we get it right every time. I think you as members um, often advocate for people in those circumstances, perhaps where we have not delivered to the standard we would wish or expect. And the report profiles some of the complaints that have been received. I think it's important to note that the vast majority of those complaints are not generally upheld. Um, as Chief Social Officer, I'm proud of all of the services that we deliver and I hope that you too, you are too. In terms of the report, it's presented in a structure um, and guidelines are set out by Scottish Government. Within this context, there is a heavy focus on the statutory work, noting that social work and social care are delivered within a statutory frame framework and there are certain situ situations where we must become involved with people. However, I believe the report also sets out how we undertake this challenging work in a very positive way. Whilst understanding the statutory context is really important, I believe it is of equal importance to highlight that social work and social care is so much more than this. If we are confined to only delivering statutory ser services, the outcome for people will be so much poorer. One of the key functions of social work and social care is to collaborate and partner with people and all those who support them. No one person lives in isolation. They have a network around them and it is when this work network comes together that we can all understand what good life looks like for, for that person and how we work to work together with them to help them live that best life. I hope, there, I hope the report showcases that collaborative approach. So I'll ask Rab, at, with fingers crossed, to play the video and at the conclusion I'll make some more comments. Thanks, Marino. Uh, just for a minute, Rob. Folks online, uh, some folk have got uh, their, or a individual maybe, has got their microphone on. Could you please mute your microphone, please? Thanks, Rob. Bye. 
Thanks very much, Rob. Um, thanks for that. I hope you enjoyed that short video presentation. I think this, when I was watching that famous quote came to mind about a picture being better than a thousand words and I think there were some great photographs in there. Oh, I have to confess, I should have edited better because I think Craig and Eddie featured quite a bit uh, in those pictures. Um, and I know Craig, you 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 were the you were the judge of the care home bake off day, so that featured also. <laughs> so so thanks. Just moving forward, I'll consider some of the areas that we need to focus on as we look forward. Uncertainty remains about the scale, scope, constitution, and timing of the national care service, and there is no doubt that this causes uncertainty across the profession. This is particularly felt. This is perhaps particularly felt in the children and justice social work services, given the uncertainty about inclusion or not. You will be aware of the, the significant budget challenges that have already been touched on a few times today. Um, they are facing the public sect sector more broadly and are certainly felt within the health and social care partnership. As Chief Social Officer, I believe it's my responsibility to profile the impact that this has on the delivery of social work and social care. The context is challenging, one of year on year, service reduction and, cha and ch challenge and change to adapt. Um, and that's seen with increasing complexity. There's a real risk to delivery of quality social work and social care services in this context, particularly the ability to support people at the earliest opportunity. As you would expect, we will meet those challenges head on and strive to support our workforce to continue to develop with flexibility and, adapt and adaptability. It is important that we look after the workforce. They are our greatest and most valuable asset. We will never stand still and there is a huge amount of work ongoing around, for example, GURFI, reablement, developing a trauma-informed and responsive workforce, developing restorative approaches and, and refreshing GURFI. Key to the ongoing development is self-evaluation and quality assurance. This is how we can answer the question, how well do we know ourselves and what do we need to do to be better? There has been much activity around this and this will continue. I know that there is room for improvement and development and much more for us to do. Before I conclude, I would wish to profile one of the personal stories in the report. This story centred on the impact of the intermediate care team and was feedback from a, from a family who said, soon became apparent to my sister, mother and I that following my dad's discharge from hospital, we could not give the care and attention he required despite our best efforts. My sister contacted the GP and they arranged for your team to visit that day. The practitioner who came assessed my dad and assured him all would be OK, whilst explaining everything to my mother and I and what the next steps were. This was a Friday afternoon and somehow she managed to get the carers in by Sunday. She also arranged a community alarm and for other professionals to visit. The other team members were very helpful, arranging grab handles, bed frame, toilet frame and a high back chair to assist my dad's mobility. In the weeks to come, they, achieve, they encouraged my dad with exercises and setting him small goals to achieve. They were a big help in getting my dad up and mobile again and kept encouraging him. The carers are brilliant, superb, always happy and encouraging. They saw my dad at his worst, but never let his spirits drop or let him know that he wouldn't improve despite his slow progress at first. Always happy, pleasant and singing. They made him smile. Um, I'm not sure singing's in the job description, but I think that's a, a fantastic um, personal story. I think it's really powerful um, from the perspective of, of the family and it illustrates the power of collaborative working, partnering with, partnering with the person and their family to achieve positive, perhaps for them, unimaginable outcomes. It showcases the importance of relationship-based practice um, and, it's, and it's what we want to achieve as we go forward. So I'm going to conclude at that point, recognising that there's so much more in the report that we could profile, but I think you've had a long um, day. So in conclusion, I'll take it back to the recommendations in the report and in, in particular, the ask around appreciation for the workforce. Thanks very much and I'm um, happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Marion. Absolutely. I think you've got everybody's support for the workforce and I'd love to meet some of them at any time for a coffee. Well done. Uh, brilliant report. Uh, all the details in there, folks. I'm going to open it out. Councillor Maitland. Uh, Marion, just want to say thank you very much. Thank you so much for the video and uh, the small stories always 
remind us that behind everything we saw in the video are people and the people that are most vulnerable. And that's why the team are our greatest asset, social care and social uh, care workers, definitely. I, so uh, not just from me, I'm sure I speak for all my colleagues here. Thank you so much for the work you do. I appreciate this as a start to the report, but it comes over as human. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, folks. Councillor McGee. I, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, just a question, Marion, a couple of points. Uh, we talk about we're overspend, but I noticed that we're inter intervention prevented 443 hospital visits. So how much does that save? You know, it doesn't save us or anything, but it must save someday because it goes to a hospital visit I know it not necessarily just a visit, but being in the hospital for a length of a number of days, somebody must be saving the money due to the intervention that we've spent our money providing. So I was wondering, is there some kind of cost that we could see regarding that? Thanks, Councillor McGee, for that really easy question. <laughs> um, I'm I'm, I'm not sure I've got the accounting or adding up skills of Joe, but I think there is no doubt that um, preventing hospital admissions and in, in hospital treatment not only saves the NHS, um, and we, we saw some of that at the IJB yesterday in terms of what that cost avoidance was, and it, it will be multiple thousands of pounds and possibly into hundreds and millions of pounds that we, we um, achieve in terms of cost avoidance. However, there is a benefit in terms of the service in the longer term, because if someone is admitted to hospital and requires support, um, we know that hospital admissions reduce independence, they reduce people's um, mobility, they add um, age years onto them in terms of that mobility. So so we know that there's a benefit for, for, for the service in the longer term around that as well. These are all really difficult to cost, but... Um, if if you are keen to find out what that might look like, we'll we'll seek to see what we can do around around that. Thanks. Hope that answers the question. No, yeah, I, th I think I think uh, we all need to start uh, working together. But just a wee anecdotal uh, point: as uh, somebody wants to move, I know somebody that wants to move in with her mum to look after the mum. But in the current legislation with housing, for all the right reasons. Uh, they're not allowed to do that because they might lose their uh, right to that house if they move out their existing house. So these wee things all add up. And uh, if that's a saving in the long term, I totally understand where heads of service will be saying, yeah, but that's costing me. So it's a cost on my budget. The end budget, you're absolutely right. Everybody wins, but the, the department that's spending the money out to get that small change is uh, losing money. So it's a big... It's a big thing that everybody needs to work together. Leader. No, absolutely that. And that was the point that you know I think Eddie made it earlier when we were talking about the forty million and but it goes absolutely beyond that. And we have that kind of culture here that we, that's what we try to do. You know, tax avoidance whether not internally but externally too. And we really need to, you know, we wishing to be too scared than other other community planning partners, they need to step up to the plate too, to be quite brutal about it. And hopefully, you know, there is a willingness with, with, with some there, but we just need to give them all the encouragement we can. No, thanks, Councillor Maitland. Just Councillor McGee raised the cost. We did have a little bit of a stab at it yesterday, if I remember correctly. I think it was £260 per day, and that's just for the hospital bed, and it wasn't the services around it and the services we saved. So I think it might be an interesting exercise to just take... One person that say stayed for you know five days, or one person who stopped staying for five days, and what that cost was to maybe putting in a care and at home package. But the thing is, we're the health and social care partnership, so that's where it fits. We might be saving in one area, but we're you know losing in another. But in the end, it's about the person, and that, that like the person you spoke about as well. I've been through it myself. Getting the help at home can absolutely change somebody's life in hospital too long, they deteriorate so badly and takes longer and longer to recover. So it might be nice just to take one exercise and maybe bring it back at another time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McGee. <clears throat> Thanks, Provost. Uh, there's a lot in the report, Marion. I'm only picking out two points of, of interest to myself. And one's 
uh, noticeable to me because we're speaking earlier about absence. And I've seen a bit where we were looking after our staff there, uh, well-being spaces, etc., etc. Uh, what benefit does that bring to our workforce? And no question for you, but is that something that we do for our workforce uh, at the waste management? Can, could we, there's enough space down there we could put a garden in uh, with some benches where guys could go and have their piece. I, I don't can put their foot or up for that or no, but maybe that's something to uh, make our workplace uh, a better place. Thank you. If I may, Provost. Um, no, abs absolutely. Um, I think we learnt through the pandemic that um, our staff work incredibly hard um, I need a good place to uh, decompress. Not not necessarily a good place to have go and have their lunch, but if they've had a difficult visit, have a place where they can go, um, sit down and have the opportunity to reflect. And I think throughout the pandemic, we similarly learned that a focus on well-being um, would would pay back dividends in terms of um, what we got back from people. It's also just about showing folk how much we appreciate what they do and creating positive work conditions for them that would make us a much more attractive employer. So I think there are multiple benefits in, in looking after our workforce in that kind of a way. Thank you, Provost. <clears throat> Clearly, the well-being of all of our staff that work for council and partnership is really important. And you know, any way in which we can do that in a reasonable fashion would be as supportive of mine. A lot of my workforce are out in the open quite a lot, so actually, time within a space that's covered and out with the elements is actually what they're looking for. So, it actually, is something we've picked up as part of the engagement through the employee survey, and I've actually set out some clear actions that I'll be taking around about folks' well-being. So, I've certainly got that as an action for the services referenced. Thanks. Oh, thanks very much, Blair. That's good. Councillor Watts. Uh, thank you, Provost. Um, Marion, uh, thank you very much for the report. Um, it's very detailed and it's it's really excellent. Um, just a couple of points. Um, and it's on fostering and adoption. Um, it's absolutely excellent to see what a brilliant job we are doing and the team is doing with fostering and adoption. Um, to have very good uh as a you know as a result from on adoption which we know is very very sensitive and delicate and can be very difficult um is absolutely brilliant so well done to yourself and to the team for getting those results within that area but well done to the team across the whole area okay oh lovely words thank you folks we okay it's just uh, the recommendations are there to be noted, except thanks to the Chief Social Work Officer, I'm going to jump straight in to uh, item eight, which is the East Asia Violence Against Women Partnership. And this is the refreshed position statement on commercial sexual exploitation. And Marin again. Thank you, Provost. Um, members, you've had a varied day today. Um, so thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce and present to you to the, up, the updated position statement of commercial sexual exploitation. East Ayrshire Council really led the way in 2017 when you approved the position statement on prostitution. You were the first to do so, uh, with other councils following your lead thereafter. The updated position statement has been developed by East Ayrshire's Violence Against Women Partnership. Since 2017, since the 2017 position statement was approved at the Council, there has been much development nationally, led by Scottish Government COSLA and locally around the Violence Against Women and Girls agenda. We now, we now have a refreshed, equally well, equally safe strategy, which is Scotland's strategy to tackle violence against women and girls, and Scotland's strategic approach to challenging and deterring men's demand for prostitution and supporting the recovery and sustainable exit of those involved in prostitution. And that was published earlier on this year. It is in consideration of these key strategic documents and updated international research that an, up, that an update in the prostitution uh, position statement was considered appropriate. The refreshed pos position statement presented has had a name change. 
there is there, there, this is in recognition that commercial sexual exploitation is broader than, than prostitution. It includes a range of activities such as lap dancing, webcamming, prostitution, and so, so on. And this is clearly articulate and articulated and set out in the Equally Safe Strategy. The refreshed position statement is, apt, is able to capture developments that have taken place at a local level in East Ayrshire, with the Bronze Award of Equally Safe at Work being granted to East Ayrshire Council. Equally Safe at Work aims to, to overcome the barriers of women entering and remaining in the workplace to secure opportunities to reduce women's poverty, which is the main cause of women being exploited through prostitution and commercial sexual exploitation. The refreshed document also highlights East Ayrshire's commitment to supporting women involved in commercial exploitation through an action in, a, in the Safer Delivery Community Plan 2024-27. The refreshed position statements defines commercial sex, sexual exploitation as a form of gender-based violence perpetrated due to gender inequality in society. It rejects the view that commercial sex, sexual exploitation is a valid form of work and a civil right and advocates for support for women involved through mainstream and specialist services. The, the, the revised position statement is set out in paragraph 4.8 of the report and sets out the following. We believe that, sec that commercial sexual exploitation is a form of gender-based violence which is caused and perpetrated by gender inequality in society and is harmful to all involved. We reject the view that commercial sexual exploitation, including prostitution, is a valid form of work or a civil right which should be legalised and regulated. We advocate that those involved require appropriate support to reduce the harm they have experienced and increase their options of, for exiting commercial sexual exploitation. We will seek to provide appropriate support to all those involved to mitigate harm and provide alternatives for those who want to exit commercial sexual exploitation, including prostitution, through working with mainstream and specialist services to raise the awareness of commercial sexual exploitation and, pro and, pro and provide employees with the necessary skills to support the women involved. Any work undertaken by East Ayrshire Violence Against Women and Girls Partnership recognises that any form of commercial sexual exploitation is an abuse of women and girls' rights, which impacts their safety, health and well-being. East Ayrshire Violence Against Women Partnership takes a gendered approach to addressing the harms caused by commercial sexual ex exploitation, recognising victims are overwhelmingly women, and girls, whilst those benefit or profiting from commercial sexual exploitation, are overwhelmingly men. The appendix to the report um, really sets out the wider context, the research, and it is in effect the workings out that led the group that um, worked on this to concluding that, that, that what I've just read out as, as the revised position statement. So in conclusion, I would like, I would like to invite you to consider the position statement and turn you to the recommendations in paragraph two, ultimately asking you to endorse and adopt the updated position statement on commercial sexual exploitation. Um, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Marion. Yeah, absolutely important. Uh, we have, and uh, we're so proud to be the first council to get this all into place. has to be looked at regularly, and uh, I fully support this. Councillor McMahon. Thanks, thanks, Provost. Thanks very much for bringing this forward again, Marion. Uh, delighted to see it coming. Uh, as uh, an authority, we've already started in that road. Obviously, we're locked down, so we have zero tolerance for that. There'll be no application. It's, any applications come in, we refuse. So we're well down that road, but I'm absolutely delighted to see this coming. Uh, as we fast approach uh, the 16-day campaign coming along, I would certainly encourage all my male colleagues in the room uh, to attend any events that they can. It's always an advantage because when I attend them, I'm in rooms of 120 women and maybe five men. So I'd like to see the tables turning that with the support of my male colleagues in the room. Thank you. We don't... I it's no, it's an excellent paper, and I uh, agree with uh, Jim's co comments. And you know, this affects our communities here in East Ayrshire, no different from anywhere else. But you know, there's been a number of instances in my own ward, uh, even uh, very recently. But the 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 
major uh, issues that's, uh, or incidents or whatever you want to call it has been involved in human trafficking. And, you know, we really need to be speaking to some of the migration authorities because we shouldn't shoulder some of the burden for that, for this as well because some of that lies, you know, within the, with the UK government and others to, to try and do what we can to control this and make sure, you know, it's an international issue, uh, not just a, a one pro quo to ourselves. No, thank you. Councillor Hogg. Thanks, Provost. The only kind of thing I would like to say um, in relation to it, and how I, I do agree, but when we don't leg legalise sex work, um, uh, we're failing in some way to keep our uh, women safe, as they still have to hide from the police, as it's a criminal activity. Um, likewise, we should be having more criminal prosecutions for the users of the service. So although I agree overall, I do think that... Um, there is a case for legalising an aspect of the work to protect women who are involved in the in these kind of um, trades at the moment. That's just a, a point. Yep, absolutely understand that point. Oh, Marion, yep, sure. For me, Provost, thank you. Um, Councillor Hogg, thank you. Um, I think as the Violence Against Women and Girls Partnership they would wholeheartedly agree with um, what what you're saying, and um, we would we would like to go much further, but we have to work within um, the l current legislation. Clearly, there's a there's an ambition set out around moving this forward um, and managing um, women in a different managing and supporting women in a different way. So, I agree with what you're saying, um, but we're working within the constraints that we have at the moment. And I think the position statement goes, and it does push our colleagues in Police Scotland quite far. Um, they've been quite uncomfortable, but they, they are, are very much constrained by uh, the legislative context in which they operate. Um, but they are very clear about how they seek to take a supportive and not criminalising approach towards women. Thanks. Yeah, it's one of those anomalies where the victims become criminals. And uh, it's always been there. We need to change it. Um, Deputy Provost, Claire. Thanks, Provost. I just off the back of what the leader was saying. Um, I've always been a supporter of a movement called Fight the New Drug. Um, and it talks a lot about sex trafficking. We're seeing a lot of increasing here and in, in nationwide. Um, Fight the New Drug did a study um, and it was by the numbers as the porn industry connected to sex trafficking. After getting the rabbit hole with that, I would just say every day today is a good day to stop watching porn. Serious, yeah, serious right. issues there. Absolutely. Folks, are we okay with Marion's report? Accept the refresh. Thank you very much, Marion. Thank you. Uh, nearly there, folks, nearly there. And uh, we're on to the motions now. And this is the motion by Councillor James Adams, the first one. And uh, I'll bring in Councillor Adams to speak to the motion. Thanks, Jim. Uh, over the summer, my constituents have been raising two key issues more than any others. These are the impact that girls are having in their lives. And the second is the unacceptable level, level of litter within our communities. Well, some in the chamber may feel it's unhelpful to conflate these two issues. I believe the problems are inextricably linked. It may be reasonable to ask why are our communities infested with gulls when in a landlocked local authority there is no natural food source to be found here. The issue, of course, is that the gull population in East Ayrshire has grown exponentially due to a readily available food source. Gulls should be a coastal species the car parks, streets and roofs of East Ayrshire are not their natural habitat and fast food is certainly not their natural diet. Sadly, the majority of the bins that we in East Ayrshire provide are not fit for purpose. The majority of our current bins are open to the elements and are easily accessible to gulls, crows, rats and other vermin. While this provides an obvious health and safety risk, the other issue is that the bins we provide are currently counterproductive. I believe that well-intentioned members of the public do wish to keep our streets clean. They deposit their rubbish responsibly in the bins that we provide. However, as soon as the waste is deposited, it's almost pulled out just as quickly by an opportunistic bird in search of an easy meal. The litter consequently pulled out is an unfortunate environmental byproduct. The local retail parts are a prime location for this animal interaction. 
With limited enforcement in these retail parts, the litter often goes unchecked and becomes somebody else's problem. The litter produced in the retail parks and indeed elsewhere flows onto the public highways, private gardens and onto the streets. Rightly, we have used a good deal of our public money to support a civic pride team and keep our streets clean. Yet examples like this highlight that much of the cleaning up they do is avoidable and takes our time away from other worthy civic projects. This does not appear to be a problem for our neighbours in North and South Ayrshire, where they have vermin-proof bins. What is also very puzzling to me is that within our own local authority, the Leisure Trust properties have those have no vermin issues as they have invested in vermin-proof bins. I am a nature lover. I don't wish to demonise any bird or animal, but we're not helping these creatures or supporting our taxpayers by failing to address the issue that we are supplying gulls, pigeons, rats, foxes, etc. with an unnatural diet, promoting their urbanized, urban colonisation and as a result bringing them into conflict with the public. I have received correspondence from residents who are effectively prisoners in their own home due to aggressive animal behaviour. The noise and faecal waste are also reasons why residents have informed me that they feel unsupported and are looking to move out of East Ayrshire. Gulls are a protected species that cannot be culled or have their nests disturbed, but we can play a part in removing their unnatural food source by ensuring all our bins are vermin-proof by the end of 2026, and working with our commercial partners to encourage them to do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you have a seconder for the motion? I second that, Provost. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want to say any, Ellen, any words? No, 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 that's that's absolutely fine. Thank you. Um, folks, we'll open, open it out now for discussion. Are there any... Councillor McMahon. Thanks very much. And I wholeheartedly agree with a lot of the sentiments that James has brought to the table this morning. There's only one thing that concerns me. Run about this and now and again, it would come back to budgets at this particular time and what that cost would incur. If I, uh, I don't know whether we'll have the figure at hand, but do we know how many public bins we have out through... The authority. Who you provost? Uh, you're looking at around two thousand street bins. So, two thousand street bins. Uh, at what cost does a new bin, the new the the the, the vermin proof bin, come at? Uh, thank you, Councillor McMacken, through you, Provost. So clearly, you would need to go through a robust procurement exercise to establish the best market value for scale. Um, however, uh, analysis and conversations with our neighbours who have vermin-proof bins would suggest that some of the average costs would be around about £550 per bin. Um, thank you. So, if I could just carry on, Provost. So that's it's no budget at four just now, is it? Through your provost. So no, there is no budget in place for that at the moment. It may be of members' interest that a next review that I would look to kick off will be of my greener communities department. Yeah. Um and clearly street scene is part of greener communities. Um therefore um I would look to consider um this request as part of my wider review. I would Certainly propose that and agree that. Thank you. Right, thanks, uh, uh, Provost. And uh, in terms of James, in terms of the absolute uh, sentiments behind it, and you know, I, I don't need it reported to me. I can hear them. It's clear it was mentioned earlier at four o'clock in the morning when they're the worst. Uh, and what a noise uh, they, they, they do make. I think we should try and uh, attempt to make uh, our bins where possible uh, vermin proof. And I know that work's already started. And I know this subject has come up both at the Kilmarnock strategic, strategic Group and at the Kilmarnock Board, where there has been discussions about you know, reducing the number of bins. I know some of the other local members have been have been suggesting that we reduce. You know, the I think two thousand the bins. I think ten percent of them are in King Street alone. Uh, uh, Blair, but I think we we need to just you know there's. A, there's Totally agree with the sentiments behind the, the motion, but in terms of the practicalities, if we can get other folk to pay for it, if we can reduce the number of bins, there's a number of places we can go that could all be part of the review. But uh, 
I, I've seen some of these bins, you know, doing at the front at Troon and elsewhere, and they are, they are they do have success in keeping the the feeding stations, the uh, type bins that we've got, uh, and they, they do work. But I just maybe ask for a wee bit of patience. And I know it's, it's a situation we discussed earlier today about, this, about the gull problem, but practically there's solutions out there. Let's work towards them. We had a number of approaches, uh, and uh, I think there's some already some good work taking place already, and just work, work with that just to get some some progress on that and task as part of the next review that we try and do that where possible and get get the vermin off the street. Thank you, Councillor Richardson. Hey, thanks, Provost. Hey, listen to, to James' motion and, and uh, uh, Councillor Adam made, made some uh, very, very good points and I'm in agreement with almost everything he, he said. The only one thing that worries me and my two colleagues Councillor McMahon and, uh, and Councillor Reid uh, br brought up the the cost implications. So um, a couple of things that I was going to say. Again, I've I've used the uh, Dougie mentioned the bins down at Trin Flint. I've used them. Brilliant, because I mean, you put the rubbish in the chip poke or whatever, and it tells you that it's compact in the way. So the first thing is the problem with a lot of the bins that I see out in about Comarnock is that you've got your uh, McDonald's next cups and your boxes for KFC and the waste goes into the bin, but the bin's no compact in it. So before long, the bin's overflowing. These bins are actually crushing the stuff internally. In fact, the bin tells you that it's compacting your waste once you put it in. So the bin's talking to you saying, hang on a wee second, I'm compacting your waste. So so basically the bin's going to hoard, each individual bin's going to hoard a lot, lot more stuff. So that's the first thing. Um, say. <laughs> Second thing is Blair mentioned was it five hundred and fifty quid each Blair? That's an average figure, and I haven't yeah. really went through anything. No, well, but that's just some some conversations that I've had aye, with colleagues. Aye, no problem. We're not going to hold you to it. So, um, surely there's a surely there's a case where, and again, James mentioned it are retail parks because the biggest problems I see are. Queen's Drive, where you've got Burger King, KFC, McDonald's, all within the same area. And they've got old-fashioned bins where it's all overflowing, the gulls are pulling it out, and the stuff's floating everywhere. So could the council no contact these retailers who are part of the problem? Let's face it, because the way they package up the fast food is a major part of the problem. Could we no contact them and sort of say to them, look, can we no enter into some kind of partnership here where we can fund these bins but in partnership, they pick up part of the cost. We pick up part of the cost. So it was only it was just a couple of wee ideas there. The only thing with that, but, uh, David's away at you know, a very important meeting represent the council, but he'll tell you that um, unfortunately that's not part of legislation. They provide uh, the food in the containers, and it's up to the individual to uh, do it. But you're absolutely right. Uh, we, we really have been pushing retailers to have a bit of responsibility and I think Claire's going to touch on that. Councillor Maitland. Uh, thank you. Yes, it's about the um, when we use commercial waste teams, uh, waste management um, companies, and they don't have lockable lids. And we see it in the rear of Titchfield Street with all the um, bins that are there. So I, I'd love to know if there is any form of enforcement that we can use with the co commercial waste Could we force them to be using seagull-proof bins that talk to you? Through you, Provost, I'm sorry, but I, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> and I would need David Mitchell to be giving me some advice round about that. I'm not clear on the enforcement legislation as clear as what my colleague would be. I'm sorry, members. It's fine. We'll ask David to look at that because you're absolutely right. Retailers need to have responsibility for things. Councillor Boyd. Thanks. Um, I get Council Adam's points in the bins and I'm supportive of it. Even and there is a cost, I think. Did I do a rough cost? It'd be a million pounds if I get my sums right. So I couldn't afford that, even if we phased it in targeted areas like King Street, Portland Street first. But there is a bigger picture here, and I know Blair's going to be busy after his waste management review. The next review, I think, is going to be greener communities, which to be honest is badly needed because it's not just the bins, it's you know, the you go into the town centre and people are leaving little on top of the bins and the bins are dirty you know I had problems with complaints about one just outside Greg's it was the day of the Commander Fair Festival and it was 
you know, I, I've reported it on. And it's clean now, but it, it was filthy in that day. And it's same with the Burns events. Um, so as well as the bins, but we need to keep them cleaner as well and try and stop the waste piling on, on top of it. The new ones that run about Commander Cross with the wee openings in them, they're quite low as well. You know, if you've got kind of problems with your mobility, with your hips, your back, try to bend into them and put your waste into the wee ducats. It's, it's not too easy either, but at least the girls kind of get into them. But aye, it's, it's a big problem there. And, you know, I'm sure most of the councillors here, especially in Kilmarnock, most of their complaints come in for constituents about overflowing bins. So I think when the team get to do this review of greener communities, one thing we need more than any others is more workers in the street. And I know that's not easy with budget constraints, but... It, we might need some form of redeployment, but I can see it out there. We need more street cleaners, you know, and that's a basic service because it, we've talked about the town centre parking charges, but another factor in people going elsewhere is the perceived lack of cleanliness in the town. You know, I'm getting it all the time, and I know other commander councillors are as well. Well, we're kind of drifting away from uh, what the motion was, but um, but we take that take that on board. Uh, Councillor Mabin and then Councillor Mc. Thank you, Provost. That's, I think it's an excellent motion, That's, um, and we're all we're all agreeing that bins should be vermin proof. I think it just needs a wee tweak on the wording um, for e, for EAC officers to come to bring in forward a paper on feasibility of all refuse bins being vermin proof. Um, by the sounds of it, replacing two thousand bins would be far too expensive, so we would have to date in stages. But I think we could support the motion from Councillor Adams, everyone together, if we just tweak the wording a wee bit. Thank you. No, thank you. Councillor McGee. Hi, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, I think some bins have got to be replaced eventually anyway. Again, it must be through attrition. Uh, and... I think maybe I'm fully supportive of the of the motion, but I think by putting the target 2026 maybe gave us too much of a burden. And I think we need to know also what is being proposed uh, by environmental health, because as David Mitchell pointed out earlier the day, they're going to be a paper coming to us uh, fairly soon. Uh, so I agree with Councillor Mabin, maybe uh, Councillor Adams, uh, Motion just needs tweaked slightly in the wording, but I'm very supportive of it. But I do appreciate that by getting that target at 2026, maybe placed an unnecessary uh, financial uh, or perceived financial burden. Thank you. Oh, thank you, leader. I, I think we could all get around it if you take the actual target date out, out the uh, the proposal as some something that we all want, but we kind of, you know, forget, we want our bins to do other things as well, you know, uh, in terms of recycling, and uh, we've spent quite a bit of money, you know, putting new recycling bins, and they've been quite effective, and they tend to be seagull proof as well. So, you know, as, as part of a wider strategy, we would seek, you know, the, as early as possible to try and make our bins as uh, as, as vermin proof as possible, and, and, and rationalise the bins, because in some areas we've got far too many bins. Uh, and I don't know the wee guy that goes down there, or, or woman, uh, who goes down uh, King Street and inspects the bins. You know, it just he's got his work cut out. You know, and there's probably nothing in them because there's you know there's literally must be about forty bins and a uh, hundred yards of King Street, uh, and it just doesn't make doesn't make sense. And there's there's places that don't have there's places that don't have bins at all. So there, there needs to be a wider review. But I totally agree with. Uh, the, you know, the sentiment behind where James has come from and we can certainly support it if, if you take away the target date because the target date puts the financial pressure on that we can't afford at this time. Right, folks, we've had the, the, the motion and seconded. Uh, we've no had any alternative. Do you want Blair? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Provost, and through you. I suppose the ask for me is, is that you don't look at the, the bins in isolation members and that, in fact, it does form part of a wider strategic review of the greener communities, just like I've done with the waste service. So we're able to understand in the whole context what that would mean for the service in terms of investment, resources required, so on and so forth. That would that would be more in the comments, Provost. Thank you. Got that, got that. 
So, um, proposal and seconder for the motion. Uh, is there any otherwise? Leader. I'm, I'm just asking James if he's prepared to change the motion and take out the target date. We'd, we'd, we'd be able to support it. If, if he doesn't, I'd have to you know, put a motion that said that took out the target date and, and as part of a wider review. Uh, something like that. But if James is prepared to take the target date, there's something we could all get behind. Thanks for all the comments. Um, the real cost isn't the, the million pounds. The real cost is to the lives of the residents that are living in East Ayrshire who are blighted by this pest at the moment. Uh, we all hear from them. They're sending us emails on a daily basis. We need to do something about it. However, if by amending the date or sliding the date gets a resolution, and I hear what Blair's saying, we need to work towards having a cleaner, greener community. So I can work with that. That's fine. Right, okay. Clear. Aye, thanks. I'm in agreement with everything um, that's been said. I just think moving forward, if we're going to look at seagull proof bins, just to make sure that they're easily accessible for people also with disabilities. Um, we know that some um, other places through it, you need the bins that you like lift the patch on, do you know the one I'm talking about? Um, and I think there was an issue elsewhere where um, there was people unable to dispose of their waste at all in some high streets because of that. Um, local authorities subsequently fixed that, I'm led to believe. Um, so just if we could have that in our four, uh, front going forward. I know you get different types of bins, but I don't know what kind of bins we're talking about. But um, just to have that mindful moving forward to make them accessible for everybody, except for the seagulls, obviously. Right, Eddie, yep. Yeah. Thanks, Provis. So, uh, members, so slightly amended. So for... For East Ayrshire Council to commit ensuring as part, part of a wider greener communities review all refuse bins in East Ayrshire are vermin proof and then the rest stays in. In addition, we would actively encourage all privately managed bins to meet the same target if members are in agreement with that. Right, no, thanks. We've got the uh, affirmative from proposal and seconder. Thanks for that, folks. Um, and we'll look forward to the report uh, coming through. Uh, second uh, motion, 9-2, is again from James. And I'll hand over. Thank you, Provost. Uh, so, Bill Shankly, William Murdoch, John Boydor, Alexander Fleming, John Latter, Maggie McIver, Andrew Fisher, William Sloan, all inspiring sons and daughters of East Ayrshire who should be celebrated. But they've one thing in common. They all became famous for their achievements after they left East Ayrshire. While not born in East Ayrshire, it could be argued that Robert Burns only really became famous because of what he achieved in East Ayrshire. In Kilmarnock in July the 31st, 1786, John Wilson published 612 copies of poems, chiefly in the Scottish dialect, more commonly known as the Kilmarnock edition. It contained poems such as Twa Dugs, To a Louse, To a Mouse, The Holy Fair and Halloween, although Burns wasn't clear at that point if Kilmarnock celebrated Halloween on a Friday night or on the 31st of October. There were 612 copies that were sold by public subscription. Doesn't seem like a lot, but compare that to the much vaunted Bronte sisters, who a few years later printed mm -hmm. a thousand copies uh, of their poems, and they only sold two. Burns sold out his 612 without exception. He was on the road to stardom. Globally, Burns is the third most popular statue behind Queen Victoria and Christopher Columbus. That's if you exclude religious people. The song Old Lang Syne is the most common sung, sorry, most commonly sung song that's attributed to somebody who's written it. East Ayrshire also has the largest collection of Burnsania in the world, which was bought by the old council from James McKee. That was previously displayed for those of us who are old enough to remember in the former Burns Monument Museum as early as 1879. It was there up until, well, within my living memory. Most of it now resides in the Dick Institute. Part of the celebration eh, that I would propose or would be the possible restoration of Mrs Gregory's piano, which is part of the McKee collection. Mrs Gregory was a close friend of Burns and once owned the only piano in Kilmarnock. It was at that piano 
Burns first listened to the music that he had composed. The RSNO have also been in regular contact with the Leisure Trust and the Number Nothing Club about putting on a show in East Ayrshire to mark the historic milestone of the publication of the first edition. We also have other local items such, of, uh, such as Burns' inscribed window from Loudon Mance that was recently repaired by the BBC repair shop team and is soon to appear in the BBC. Each year, Kilmarnock hosts the first edition festival, which is generally delivered by willing volunteers from Kilmarnock's three local Burns clubs, the World Federation, the Hoof, which are, uh, our own provost is a member, and Kilmarnock Number Nothing Club. With these Burns clubs, the Leisure Trust and Centre Stage all supporting this motion, I would call on my fellow elected members to back the motion and add the Council's support to what should be an event of national importance. Thank you. Thank you. Need a seconder? Councillor Boyd? Thank you, Provost. Um, it's been a long day, so I'll just finish in a lighter note, just a wee verse here. Swift to the Laykirk, in and all, and there take up your stations. Then after Begbies in a row and pour divine libations for joy this day. That's from the ordination, Burns' poem in the first edition book, which was published in Kilmarnock. Um, it describes Burns' time in Kilmarnock. He goes to the Lake Kirk, and then after Lake Kirk, he meets his pals, nips down the wee tight lanes and nukes of Kilmarnock and off to the pub. Burns, you think about um, Alloway, Mochlin and Dumfries come to mind, but if it wasn't for the first edition being printed in Kilmarnock, Burns was off to Jamaica. The actual statue at Kilmarnock Cross shows I'm looking towards Jamaica. So John Wilson really rescued Burns as such, um, getting his books published, his poems published, and made them famous across the world, just as councillors Adam said there. And, you know, Burns spent a lot of time in Kilmarnock and had a real fondness in Kilmarnock, and that's why I read that verse there. He actually, um, you know, was really fond of the town and was talked up the town's history. And just to finish in an even lighter note, further down in the ordination, he must have stoked up football rivalry long before football existed. Because further down it says, or try the wicked town of here, for there they'll know you're clever. So there you go, that's maybe the start of the Kelly Air rivalry 100 years before football existed. So I'm more than happy, you know I like to talk up the town, I'm more than happy to back this motion there. Thank you. Maitland? I don't know if I have to declare an interest here. I was a Burns before I was a Maitland. Um, however, I was kind of hoping I was more related to Tommy. Um, I am all for, actually, if you think we are, but that's another story. Um, I'm all for celebrating Burns. And I actually have a very special edition um, that was given to me on a very special birthday of a copy of the Burns um, edition, and it's got pride of place. However, I think 240 years is a funny one to celebrate, and I'd have thought 200 and... 50 years would be the one to celebrate. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. So, okay. Councillor Cowan. Uh, thank you, Provost, and uh, thank you to Councillor Adams and Councillor Boyd for bringing forward the motion. Um, and I, I definitely would like to see us support it. Um, I also noticed, Provost, in your opening remarks this morning at the start of this meeting, you had some images of the this year's annual festival of the first edition. So I don't know if we can get that back up on the screen. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm putting forward the amendment or whether it's, I'm asking to supplement it, but I would like to request that East Ayrshire supports the Robert Burns World Federation to further develop the existing annual first edition festival as part of our town centre regeneration vision. I'd also like that we would further recommend that the Kilmarnock Strategic Group investigates the feasibility of developing and enhancing the street corner in front of the new Robert Burns mural into a poet's corner as a base to promote spoken word events while also formally recognising and celebrating the John Wilson printing of the Kilmarnock edition for all, all the reasons that have been put forward by Councillor Adams and Councillor Boyd. Oh, OK, thanks. Councillor Richardson. Um, I was just going to say, I think that's a, a brilliant point there by uh, Councillor Cowan, because obviously you had a few of um, us councillors at the, a recent Burns event, and some of the speakers that were there through, I think they were through the, the Federation, if you were to put 
a couple of those guys underneath the new mural and they were to start reciting Burns the way they can recite it. And, you know, they, they live the poems. They don't just speak the words. Um, before long, on a Saturday afternoon, you would have hundreds of people watching them. So that's a, a, a you know, that was a really good point made by Councillor Cowan there. I think having a, a poet's corner where people that know Burns inside out and can do the poems justice could actually speak those words. Uh, it would They would draw a huge crowd. No, it's it's a really good discussion point, and for myself, James, the two forties, just another year for me. I would really go for two the two hundred and fiftieth anniversary, where in conjunction with the council and the World Federation and the two clubs here in Kilmarnock, could be working towards the two hundred and fiftieth. I'm absolutely not against uh, the, the 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 part of celebrating Burns, but. They're really, they've really got their act together in terms of um, celebrating Burns for the printing and laying the wreath uh, at the square. Uh, it seems to be getting better and better. The economic development team, as you know, are working closer uh, with the World Federation. So I was just absolutely not against. I'd love to see that radius uh, where the mural is going out about because that's a big, big junction there. I put a Ayrshire Roads Alliance on here. So that could be extended by a couple of benches, nice Burns benches. So there's a whole host of things that could be uh, going on here. I would like, for me personally, to have a bigger uh, a magnifying glass over, not just the 240th, but every year building up to the 250th. That was, that's my, that's my, uh, uh, the way I was thinking about it. Leader. Thanks. I, I, I agree with everything that's been said so far. And I, We'd be supportive of uh, James's motion and I'd be supportive also of what uh, Elaine, Councillor Cowan, is saying as well. But I think this, not to forget, this is, you know, this year we've managed to attract the the Trad Awards for Scots Language, of which this is a, you know, Burns is at the forefront of promoting Scots Language in Cumnock. And uh, maybe a wee shout out to Cumnock, which I under, I understand from the Scots Language Society is where the purest form of Scots is spoken. Uh, you in 23 and all that kind of thing. And, and, uh, it's, uh, but I think this, this is a local authority should absolutely embrace the Scots language, you know, wherever we can, because it is a major thing that we can, you know, we can, uh, we can hold our heads up above any of the other 31 uh, local authorities and any support that we can give to uh, John Wilson Burns uh, and the role that that's played in, uh, in, uh, in our area, all the better. So, uh, there may be, you know, maybe there may be some work between ourselves and the Ledger Trust to see if we can do so, so much work to to promote Burns and the Scots language wider and right across across East Ayrshire. I make some of the fact this year that we were holding the national awards uh, in our area. Thank you, Councillor Hogg. Thanks, Chair, um, and thanks, Provis. And just to come back to the. the uh, did you know that Burns went to primary school in Durimple? So he does spread across East Ayrshire. And um, in relation to the uh, football, because you know I don't support the team that uh, resides in Kilmarnock, and I'm more biased towards the team that's near in my village, of Air United. Um, so therefore, Burns was quite right when he labelled them from Tam Shanter, or the Nick to Tam Shanter of the Honest Men. And I'll just leave that there with you. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Boyd. Oh, well, there's a replica of the Burns printing press. I think it was made about 20 odd years ago. And funnily enough, just coincidence here, um, one of my history group representatives and I met Annika um, at Dick Institute along with colleagues a couple of weeks ago because the printing press isn't fully operational. So we're hoping to get the printing press back up and running, getting the schools back out and using it. The computer that ran along with it, the kids could apparently come along and write their own poem and it would come up on the computer screen. Um, the computer's outdated, so that might be replaced. And then there was an issue with the inks, but we've got on board somebody who has a retired printer and they're going to help out. So hopefully we get the printing press up and running and we need everybody's help. We need the schools back in there using it because that's another way of promoting it. We don't just want it there as an ornament. We want it to be used because that was what it was there for. Just a wee add on. No, oh, no, absolutely. Again, it will come down to this uh, a numbers game um, because I think there's a lot of support within the chamber and online uh, 
for a whole host of ideas to celebrate Burns. But um, the, the, making a special anniversary about 240, it was just... Sorry, Jim, if you could just come back in. These events are happening for the 240th Graham. Uh, sorry, Councillor Boyd makes reference to the printing press. Uh, the RSNO are in discussion with the Leisure Trust. Um, so these events are going to be happening, and it was just to really try and get the Council's buy-in to, to do what they do. You know, we, you and I have both been to the festival, but it's to try and more formalise it. It wasn't in terms of finance. It was more to formalise that sort of support verbally. The 240th, as you correctly suggest, Jim, isn't a natural uh, date, but it's moving towards that 250th. You and I both know the the membership of the Burns Club is a uh, strong but ageing, and it would give us 10 years to try and uh, promote that uh, for the 250th. Thank you. I, th I think that's a fair point. You know, build the idea of building up to two fifty covers both the kind of the concerns there, and just I think in sort of the proposals, the points corner. I look forward to Council Adams, Council Boyd, paying uh, it for who's the best there. Uh, you get, I think Elaine will give you a wee goat run for your money as well. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I think that's a really good idea. Just. To you know, permanently recognise. We've already got you know John Wilson and Burns at the cross and all the rest of it, and I think that whole and with the, the success of that mural, I think that's been really really popular. But just and to widen that right across what we're doing across East Stairshire, to Dalrymple, to Darvel, uh, and what we're doing with Scots language, that you know some some we can promote through them as well. So you know, the more we can do, the better right across all these different kind of themes, and maybe have a kind of broader strategy when and working with the, the Leisure Trust. Now we do that to promote promote Burns in the Scots language. So is it okay, James, if we the addition of what Councillor Cowan has added, and there's nothing not it can be two forty, two forty one, two forty two. It doesn't matter. So with the addition of what Councillor Cowan has added, uh, it'd be good to talk to ERA to extend that uh, uh, the pavement there. To have I, a real, real poet scorn. Yeah, I didn't wish to overstate my mark because that would require some finance. Um, so I wasn't I wasn't looking for finance. If it's available, then great. But the motion was just for us to formally recognise the 240th anniversary by way of support. Probably I was overstepping the mark, but that was why I was trying to link it to the uh, town centre regeneration vision that has been, you know, delegated to the Commandant Strategic Group, which does actually have funds for these types of activities. And we've already tasked the Leisure Trust to look at town centre activities such as the Killaween. So for me, the idea is about getting behind the groups and the activities that are already there and all the new ideas that have just been mentioned today in this chamber and link it strategically into what we want to do in our town centre, about getting the footfall up and getting people in, using their town and loving their town again and understanding the rich heritage that is there. I was not aware that the printing press wasn't operational, so I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that there's work going on in the background to get that up and running again. Thank you. Right. Leader. I think that makes sense. I mean, the strategic group are looking for quick wins. They've got the money, James, not maybe. Maybe. <laughs> So uh, I think, you know, if we get the full weight be behind the, the council back in your motion and the, the addition from Elaine, I think that would go a long way to support us. Uh, thanks, Provost. Thanks, members. Just to, to confirm, if uh, Council Adams is, is so minded, I'm happy to take uh, this uh, to the Command Strategic Group, have the discussions and make sure that we, we build it into that planning cycle um, in terms of, you know, moving forward from the 240th anniversary and, and, and uh, on all the activities, supporting them through that means and uh, looking to identify where there's potential funding through there. Councillor Ingram. Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, absolutely um, I agree that we, we need to celebrate uh, Burns. We need to promote it uh, where possible and, and the Scots language. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm a command councillor, but I recognise that um, he's not just ours. Uh, throughout East Ayrshire, uh, I think we should be doing our, our utmost to try and uh, promote uh, Robert Burns and um, try and... Uh, leave some legacy, not just for Kilmarnock, but for, for Mocklin and Cumnock and, and other, other folks as well. OK, is Richard's words OK, James? I think that's this is really interesting. It's going to be really good when all those things come together 
uh, for the future. Uh, is, is that okay, folks, for um, we're going to accept that Richard's going to take it away with, with, with the words of the motion uh, to look towards getting a, a better uh, celebration for next year and the year after and the year after? <laughs> is that okay? And build up to that. I might not be here. Uh, oh. <laughs> the 250th but um, that would be great if we could do that uh, uh, and, and the Poets Corner is a great idea so if that all comes together that's great, thanks very much folks appreciate it and uh, just remind everybody to get down to Rugby Park tonight <laughs> to support the mighty Kelly and uh, let's get uh, Kelly into Europe thanks. thank you very much thank you <laughs> David could you stop the recording now please Bye.